this is going to be dispensational salvations. What's all the fuss about? And I had this on here, but only half of it got uploaded and I've lost it. So I'm going to re-record it and talk about this subject of dispensational salvations. Why is everybody always fussing about it? It's one of the most uh, pestering, annoying, endless arguments is about this topic of dispensational salvations. And since I've been saved and studying the Bible and listening to Christians, this is uh, the most annoying topic to hear argued back and forth for me. I don't profess to be an expert on the Bible or dispensations, but I've listened to the arguments on both sides back and forth for the past 12 years or so. And you have those who teach that everyone in the Old Testament... They teach everyone in the Old Testament was born again, sealed by the Holy Ghost, eternally secure, because they were looking forward to the cross. And there are those who who teach that, and they believe the Old Testament saints went to paradise in the heart of the earth. And there are those who teach that, and they believe the Old Testament saints went straight to the third heaven when they died. And they would use Elijah and Enoch as the proof for that. And it would make sense to teach that they, I mean, if you believe the Old Testament saints were born again and sealed by the Holy Ghost and eternally secure, if they, you believe they had all that, just like we have it, it would make sense to say that they went to the third heaven when they died and not to the heart of the earth. Because what would be keeping them from going to heaven, the third heaven in the Old Testament, if they were born again, sealed by the Holy Ghost, washed in the blood of Jesus, eternally secure, what would be keeping them from going to the third heaven if they had everything that we've got? So you have those who teach that they had everything we got and they teach that they still went to paradise in the heart of the earth, but you also have those that teach that they went to the third heaven as well. Now, another group, uh, you have those that teach that everyone in the Old Testament was saved by grace through faith, but the object of their faith was different than it is today. They weren't looking forward to the cross. Uh, they teach that keeping the law and the sacrifices were just proof that they had faith. And they say if there was no works, then there just really wasn't faith. And that's still adding works, even if you don't want to admit it. Uh, but they say if there was no works, then there really wasn't faith. And that's their way around it. And But they use that same thing today. You know, they say if there's no works, there's really no faith. Which isn't true, as we've talked about in other videos. Just because you don't have works doesn't mean you're not really saved. Because works have nothing to do with being saved. And then you have those who teach that the Old Testament saints were saved by faith plus works. Teaching, for example, that under the law they had to keep the law. And since no one kept the law perfectly, they would offer the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. And when they would try their best to keep the law and then offer the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it, this would make them keep them blameless according to the law. And... In these lessons or sermons or messages on this topic, you consistently have people throwing around the words heresy and heretic on and just giving an, an, an enormous amount of false accusations back and forth. And I don't believe that I don't believe that um, people who teach the way that I just said, are what you would call heretics at all that would teach any of the ways that I just mentioned. I don't believe that they're heretics at all. But what I believe is that most of the fighting and bickering and accusations are because one group doesn't understand what the other group believes, so it's a non-stop fuss. And I believe a lot of the confusion comes from saying the Old Testament saints were saved. That word saved even though I don't believe it's completely unbiblical to use that word for what they had, because, I mean, they were going to paradise and not hell. 
So in a sense, they were saved. But it gives people the idea that you're saying they were saved like me and you and had the benefits of the blood of Jesus and had eternal salvation and have what you have today as a born-again believer all by faith and works. When you say that the Old Testament saints were saved by faith and works, people automatically get the idea that you're saying, well, they earned their way to heaven and got all this benefits that mean you have today by their own works. And that's not what's being taught. So I personally believe, like group three, the Old Testament saints were saved by faith plus works. And like I said, I've, I use that term saved loosely because they didn't have what me and you have. They were safe by faith and works. It got them to paradise, not the third heaven. And I've, I've kind of quit using the term saved for the Old Testament saints so much because it causes everyone to believe you're teaching that they earned their own eternal salvation by their own goodness. And that's not what I believe. I'm going to tell you what I believe. And before you uh, uh, shut me off and call me a heretic, all that, here's what I believe. Uh, number one, Jesus Christ had not died on the cross yet in the Old Testament. He had not shed his blood yet. He had not been buried and resurrected in the Old Testament yet. We can all agree on that. The sacrifice of Jesus had not even taken place yet. Jesus Christ had not shed one drop of blood. And if it's by the blood of Jesus Christ that me and you get eternal salvation, and it's by that, then how would the Old Testament saints have salvation when the blood of Jesus had not even been shed yet? Think about that. You're saying that they had everything that me and you have were saved the same way, yet the very thing that saves us had not even taken place yet. Think about that. How would that be? And I know what Revelation 13, 8 says. Where it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And of course the Lord sees the end from the beginning. And he knew he would shed his blood for our sins. He knew. But that doesn't mean he went ahead and applied his blood to the Old Testament saints before his blood had even been shed. You see what I'm trying to say? Compare this to the fact that he knew I would choose of my own free will to get in Christ. He knew that one day when I was 21, I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't declare me saved, born again, and in the body of Christ and apply the blood to me until I actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you see? It doesn't make sense to say the Old Testament saints are saved like me and you when the very blood that gives us salvation and makes us saved like we are hadn't even been shed yet. And those who say that I would be a heretic for saying the Old Testament saints were saved uh, by faith and works and whatnot, they want to say we're heretics for teaching that. Uh, and they say I'm a heretic for teaching that weren't, they weren't saved the same way as us. They actually box themselves in. You see? Because if they're saying the Old Testament saints were saved the same way, they have to say they were eternally saved outside of having the blood of Jesus permanently washing their sins away and clearing them completely. Because the Old Testament saints did not have their sins washed away and cleared completely. How could they? The very thing that does that had not been shed yet. The blood hadn't been shed yet. And if they say that they did have the blood of Jesus applied to them, think about this. What was the point of the animal sacrifices? What was the point of the bloody animal sacrifices if the blood of Jesus was already being applied to the Old Testament saints? I think that's an honest, fair question we could ask. You say, well, the animal sacrifices is just a picture. 
And no doubt about it, it is a picture of the Lamb of God shedding his blood. But look at the verses about it. Verses like Leviticus 4, 25 through 26. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of burnt offering. And he shall burn all his fat upon the altar as the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin and it shall be forgiven him. <clears throat> Is that how you get forgiven today? No, not at all. So now if he if he had the blood of Jesus applied already, then why does he need to shed the blood of an animal to get forgiven? And in Leviticus 4, 27 and 28, And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish, for his sin which he hath sinned. Why is he bringing this animal for his sin which he hath sinned? I thought he had this taken care of by the blood of the Lord Jesus, as they say. You see, that doesn't make sense to say that he's already been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, but yet he's bringing this animal sacrifice. Why does he need to bring this offering for his sin which he hath sinned if he had the blood of Jesus already cleansing his sin permanently? And these are honest questions to ask yourself. Leviticus 4, 29 through 31, And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. And the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. And he shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from off the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. Now, if they just... If they just realized their guilt of sin and came to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ or looked forward to the cross in some way, and it was just like we, we do today, then why in the world does the Lord have them messing with all this animal blood, sacrificing animals, and going as far as giving them forgiveness of sins for doing it? Now, immediately, the people who teach the same, saved the same way, are going to jump up in righteous indignation and, and scream heresy. And they're going to quote verses like Hebrews 10, 4, which says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And I believe that verse just as much as you do. The blood of bulls and goats never did take away their sin. That is just what they want you to think that I teach. I don't, I don't teach that the blood of bulls and goats took away sin. The bloody animal sacrifices never took away sin, but it gave them temporary forgiveness until the next time they sinned again. And you just read where it, it would, if they did this, it would get them forgiveness of their sin. But you see, with the blood of Jesus Christ that we have the benefits of, it took away our sin past, present, and future. We did not have to have another sacrifice. He's the perfect sacrifice, you see. But one problem, the Old Testament saints didn't have the benefits of the blood of Jesus Christ. They had the bloody animal sacrifices, which never took away sin permanently. It just, it only gave them temporary forgiveness. And there's a great verse that goes along with this. In Exodus 34, 7, it says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. They did not have their uh, sins cleared because they didn't have the blood of Jesus applied to them. So, so, um, so you like to say they were saved the same way as they are today, and that's completely untrue. How could they have been saved the same way when the very blood that saves us was yet to be shed? Now, did the Old Testament saints end up getting the benefits of the blood of Jesus? Yes. You see, think about this. If the Old Testament saints 
had the blood of Jesus applied to them, then why didn't they go on up to be with the Lord when they died? They didn't. They went into the lower parts of the earth. And you know when they got out of there? Listen to this. After Jesus Christ died, shed his blood and was buried and resurrected, he took the Old Testament saints with him. You see, it all makes sense. <clears throat> they didn't have the benefits of the blood of Jesus until Jesus actually shed his blood. So until he shed his blood, they went to the lower parts of the earth. They didn't go to the third heaven. Just like it says in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that dis descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. You see, the Old Testament saints ended up getting to heaven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But to claim they were saved by the blood before the blood had even been shed really confuses everything. And there's people that teach that the Old Testament saints did go to the third heaven and they use Enoch and Elijah as uh, proof that they did. But those that would be using the over exceptions to overthrow the rule. And, and you see... That's ignoring Luke 16 and uh, making Luke 16 uh, like some type of parable or something. Luke 16 is a real thing. Lazarus was on one side with Abraham. The rich man was on the other side. And there was a great gulf fixed. The rich man could see over and see Lazarus and Abraham. And he, he begged for a drop of water on his tongue. You know the story. The rich man could see Lazarus and Abraham showing you that there was a place in the Old Testament. There was a place in the heart of the earth where Old Testament saints went at death. And then you had a place where people were in torments. And see, the Old Testament saints went down there because they did not have the benefits of the blood of Jesus yet. So no, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. And no serious Bible student ever said that. Even though they want to claim that people like me teach that they were eternally saved by faith and works and bloody animal sacrifices, that's nonsense. Now they got to paradise in the heart of the earth by their faith and works because they had to bring a bloody animal sacrifice. And if they didn't, then... Uh, they couldn't get their sins temporarily covered, you see. And if they did certain things, it would make them not righteous anymore. You see, under the law, they tried to keep the law and offer the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. And keeping the law does not mean sinless. And they didn't keep it perfectly. But but remember, the these prescribed sacrifices, when they broke it, they had to have them... And this got them temporary forgiveness. It didn't take away their sins. So, really, what is all the fuss about? Uh, I don't believe the Old Testament saints made it to heaven and got eternally secure by works. I don't believe the blood of animals took away all their sins. But it gave them temporary forgiveness for when they broke the law. Another thing is this accusation that uh, people like me believe in multiple gospels in the sense that there's multiple Gospels that give somebody eternal salvation. And they're like parrot, like parroting each other, saying, you're a heretic, you believe in multiple Gospels, saying it over and over again. And they say it over and over and over. But the first problem is the fact that they limit the word Gospel to salvation. There are different Gospels in the Bible, but Gospel means like glad tidings, good news. And it's not limited to salvation. And the only gospel that gives somebody eternal salvation is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and resurrected. That's what gives somebody eternal salvation, the blood of the Lord Jesus. To say that the Old Testament saints believed the same gospel as we do today is very unbiblical and a complete lie. And deep down, the people who profess to believe, um, believe that don't actually believe it. Do you believe that the Old Testament saints knew the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection? I challenge you to look at some verses very carefully. 
When I say that Abraham did not believe the same gospel when he was alive, immediately someone jumps up and screams heresy and calls me a heretic for saying that Abraham did not know the same gospel that I know. And they quickly run to Galatians. Galatians 1, 8 through 9 that says, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The thing is, though, the only gospel I'm going to preach to you is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the same one that Paul preached. But Abraham did not have that gospel. But they'll immediately jump to uh, Galatians 3, 8 and quote this verse, Galatians 3, 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So they say, See, Abraham knew the gospel. But look, the verse gives you the gospel that was preached unto Abraham, and it was not the death, burial, and resurrection. What was the gospel preached to Abraham? Well, it was, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And they love to use Abraham to prove that everyone in the Old Testament was looking forward to the cross and saved the same way, as they say. And I admit, Abraham was a picture of our salvation today. Because look at Romans 4, 2 through 5, where it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. There's no doubt about it that Abraham received imputed righteousness before he was circumcised. Abraham received imputed righteousness by faith. <clears throat> he received imputed righteousness without works. He got it by faith. But by faith in what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? No. Romans 4, the very chapter you're trying to use to say that he was looking forward to the cross tells you what it is he believed. Romans 4.18 tells you. It says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that, what was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So how did Abraham get imputed righteousness? By believing on Jesus Christ? He had no idea about Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross for our sins. He was believing God about his seed. And it says it right there in Romans 4, the very chapter they try to use against you. It says, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations. And Galatians 3 8 said, Preach before the gospel of, unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So Abraham was not looking forward to the cross. He, although he, he got imputed righteousness by faith, he didn't have all the benefits of salvation that me and you have. That's why in Luke 16, he's in the heart of the earth. He's not up in the third heaven. He doesn't have the benefits of the blood of Jesus. And if you want me to prove it again that what Abraham believed, look at Genesis 15, 5 through 6, when he got imputed righteousness, where it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed that he would be the father of many nations, and that in him shall all nations be blessed. And he believed the Lord about this, and the Lord gave him righteousness. Still, do you still think he was looking forward to the cross? He wasn't looking forward to the cross. He was looking for a city. Hebrews 11, 9 through 10, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You see, the Old Testament saints weren't looking forward to a cross. They were looking forward, lo, lo, they were looking for him to come with a crown and bring in the kingdom. You see, that's why that he was rejected. They thought, well, he's coming as a king and a crown, and he's going to bring in the kingdom. They didn't know he was coming to 
as a servant to die on the cross. And of course, you have prophecies of the Lord being crucified for us in the Old Testament. No doubt about it. You have pictures and types of it as well. You have prophecies about it, but you only see those because you're filtering the Old Testament through the New Testament. You see, the Old Testament saints didn't have that. And most of them didn't even have all the Old Testament when they were alive. Me and you have the benefits of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can filter the Old Testament through the New Testament, and the New Testament unlocks it for us. The prophets themselves didn't even understand what they were writing when God gave them the prophecies about the salvation that should come unto you. 1 Peter 1, 9 through 10 says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Notice it's the grace that should come. No doubt about it. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but it wasn't the grace that me and you found. The Old Testament saints, or the Old Testament prophets, prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now look at this, 1 Peter 1, 12. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves. It wasn't revealed to them. But unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. You see, they didn't get it, but we get it. They wrote it, but they didn't understand what they were writing. And it's not because we're smarter than they are or more righteous than they are. We just have our eyes open to it. And on the road to Emmaus, the Lord has to start, has to start back there in Moses. In Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and go through the prophets as well, showing himself to them in the Old Testament, you see. You see, Jesus is all through the Old Testament, obviously, on every page, but he had to go back there in Moses and the prophets and and expound to them on that on the road to Emmaus the scriptures concerning himself. They didn't know it. In Luke 24, 25 through 27, it says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They didn't realize it. They, they didn't get it. He had to show them. The disciples themselves didn't have their eyes open to the gospel when Jesus Christ preached it to them himself in the flesh. And watch what happens when the Lord gives the gospel to the disciples in Luke 18, 31 through 34. It says, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. He just told them. He just prophesied a death, burial, and resurrection to them. Now look at Luke 18, 34. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. How could it be any more clear that the disciples who walked and talked with Jesus Christ in the flesh did not even understand the gospel? They understood none of these things. The saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Yet you want to tell me they were looking forward to the cross. No, they were looking for him to come as king and take over. Still, with all this evidence, the average fundamental Baptist will jump up in his righteous indignation and scream, heresy, heresy, you're going to hell, you're a false teacher, you believe in works for salvation, and you've got it all wrong, you won't hear, you won't listen. It's like trying to explain to a two-year-old how to work as a rocket scientist because they just will not listen. It's not because you're not smart enough. You just won't hear anything other than what you've been taught and you refuse. This is your problem. You refuse to swallow your pride and admit that you're wrong. And you won't hear me when I say that I don't believe. It's like they will not hear you. 
when you say that you don't believe the Old Testament saints were eternally saved by works. Works were involved in getting them to the heart of the earth in paradise where they, where they would wait on the blood of Jesus to be shed. But it's not what got them eternal salvation. You also won't hear me when I say they all got to heaven by the blood of Jesus. The only thing is they could not get the benefits of the blood until it was shed. You're not hearing me when I say the blood of bulls and goats never took away sin. It temporarily cleared them. That's their big thing against what I teach is they say, well, in Hebrews it says the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. And I know it didn't take away their sin. It was a temporary thing. It got them temporary forgiveness. So let me turn it back around on you. You claim I teach another gospel gives people eternal salvation, right? You teach that I teach salvation outside of the blood of Jesus. That's what you teach about me. I actually don't teach either one of those things, but you do. Because you teach that Abraham was just as saved as me and you, but yet he didn't even know the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection I've, I've just proved to you. The disciples didn't even know it. So if he was saved just like me and you are, and he got eternal salvation, if he had eternal salvation... If you believe that, then you teach that he got it another way, by another gospel, and outside of the blood of Jesus. If you go around today and preach the gospel that was preached to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed, you're the one teaching the false gospel for today. You see, you need to learn to rightly divide. You teach that Abraham was just as saved as me and you, and he, he didn't even have the benefits of the blood of Jesus Christ. How could he? How could he be? The, the, the blood hadn't even been shed yet. You teach that uh, they were just as saved as me and you. How could they be? When they died, they were not absent from the body and present with the Lord. They had to go to the lower parts of the earth. Some of you teach that they had all the benefits of the Lord's bloody death, blood, and resurrection. Yet at the same time, they would have been fooling around with the blood of animal sacrifices. Wouldn't that be a little twisted to fool around with these bloody animal sacrifices when they already had the perfect spotless blood of the Lord Jesus so what's all the fuss about there's a fuss because you don't know what I teach there's a fuss because you haven't looked into any of it you simply parrot what all the great men of God have told you there's a fuss because you refuse to stand corrected there's a fuss because you don't listen there's a fuss because you don't really study this topic you just you, you just use the Bible to make evangelistic sermon after evangelistic sermon. You don't get deep in the book. There's a fuss because you're so shallow when it comes to the Bible. You refuse to take the time, and it takes time to look into these things and really figure out what's going on. You just want to make the Bible fit your mold. But do you know what happened when you got saved? Here's a few things. You got born again. You were literally born into the family of God. No one in the Old Testament was born again. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 didn't even have any idea what Jesus was talking about when he mentioned it. He thought he was talking about entering a second time into his mother's womb and being born. Now don't you think if being born again was a thing in the Old Testament... And if it was a thing in the Old Testament, it would have been a big thing. Don't you think he would have... Nicodemus would have knew about it. If you're born again, the Old Testament saints weren't born again. That alone shows you salvation is not the same. They didn't have the same salvation me and you have. It's completely different. Another thing, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you permanently and never leaves. That's not so for the Old Testament saints. Samson lost the Holy Spirit in Judges 16.20 but later got it back. David prayed for the Lord to not take his spirit from him in Psalm 51.11. Saul lost the Holy Spirit and didn't get it back in 1 Samuel 16.14. You have to admit, that's something completely different. I can't lose the Holy Spirit. It permanently lives in me. And even non-dispensationalists will admit the Holy Spirit operated much differently in the Old Testament. Doesn't that fact prove that the salvation 
back then was very different. Because when you got saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you to dwell in you forever. And it baptized you into the body of Christ. You see? That's, that's your salvation. Being baptized into the body of Christ. And that's not a water baptism. That's a baptism that took place you didn't even know about it. That the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ. Moved into you to permanently dwell there. He operates completely different now than he did in the Old Testament. So how is it the same? How can that be the same? I'm, I'm, yeah, that confuses me when you say that. The next thing is, the Old Testament saints had their own righteousness. We have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Look at Deuteronomy 6.25. It says, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Romans 3, 21 through 24. But now, notice that, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, <clears throat> they had their own righteousness in the Old Testament. Me and you had the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You say, well, they're righteous. everybody's righteousness was 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 filthy rags okay true where that's why it couldn't get them what they needed their righteousness could not get them eternal salvation but it did get them to paradise where they would wait on the lord jesus christ to shed his blood you see what i mean their righteousness that they had isn't as good as the righteousness me and you have we got the righteousness of jesus christ how could they have the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ hadn't come down in the flesh, lived a sinless life, fulfilled all righteousness, and then it took our place on the cross so that he could give us his righteousness. The next thing, when you got saved, you got spiritually circumcised. The Old Testament saints were not spiritually circumcised. When you sin... It does not contaminate your soul. Because at salvation, the Lord cut your soul loose from your flesh. So now when you sin, those sins don't contaminate your soul. They don't get on your soul. Your soul is sinlessly perfect now. The Old Testament saints, when they sinned, their soul was stuck to their flesh. So when they sinned, uh, it contaminated the soul. They would have to... Uh, all, they would have to continually offer sacrifices. You see what I mean? Now, I'm going to close out giving you some verses that are going to be hard for you to look over. And it's in Ezekiel chapter 3. Look at Ezekiel chapter 3 in verse 18. Ezekiel 3.18, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. If you die in your iniquity, you're going to hell. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, now watch this. When a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. And you say, well, this is just talking about, uh, you know, dying prematurely because of wickedness and whatnot. And not about uh, whether a person is 
considered righteous enough to be considered quote unquote saved or whatnot. But look what it says. The righteous man, if he turns from his righteousness and dies, he shall die in his sin. If you die in your sin, you go to hell. When me and you die, even though we still sin after we're saved, we're not dying in our sin. We're in the Lord Jesus. But you see, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness on the Old Testament commit iniquity, he dies in his sin. Yeah, the turning from righteousness and living wicked leads him to a physical death, but it also led him to hell as well because he dies in his sin. So they were righteous or they were wicked. And if the righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and he died, he died in his sin. And that's because he did not have spiritual circumcision. His soul was stuck to his flesh. When he sinned, turned from his righteousness, it affected the soul. You today, you're spiritually circumcised. You got the righteousness of the Lord Jesus on you, on your record. That can't be changed. So say that you turn from God tomorrow, got backslid, and you died in that state. You don't die in your sin. You're in Christ. You see what I'm trying to say? It's a completely different setup. And to say that they were saved the same way is ignoring all these clear things that I've just pointed out to you. But dispensation of salvation, what's all the fuss about? The fuss is about because people don't know what each other teaches. They've not looked into what each other teaches enough. They make a lot of presumptions. And it's just turned into a mess of a lot of unnecessary fighting back and forth. But it's like this. The Old Testament saints, uh, they were not saved the same way. Uh, you can't say that they really even had salvation. Certainly not in the sense that mean you have it today. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood from which we actually get all the benefits of salvation, where we get the righteousness of Jesus Christ from had not even been shed they didn't have that so how could they be saved the same way they weren't saved the same way that's why they didn't go to the heart of the earth I mean that's why they didn't go to the third heaven when they died they went to the heart of the earth they didn't have the benefits of the blood of Jesus but this has been dispensation of salvation what's all the fuss about